A Legend of Knockmany by William Carleton What Irish man, woman, or child has not heard of our renowned Hiberian Hercules, the great and glorious Finn McCool? Not one, from Cape Clear to the Giant's Causeway, nor from the nor that back again to Cape Clear. And, by the way, speaking of the Giant's Causeway brings me at once to the beginning of my story. Well, it so happened that Finn and his gigantic relatives were all working on the causeway in order to make a bridge, or what was still better, a good stout pad road across to Scotland. When Finn, who was very fond of his wife Una, took it into his head that he should go home and see how the poor woman got on in his absence. To be sure, Finn was a true Irishman, and so the sorrow thing in life brought him back only to see that she was snug and comfortable, and, above all things, that she got her rest well at night, for he knew that the poor woman, when he was with her, used to subject to nightly qualms and configurations that kept him a very anxious, decent man, striving to keep her up in good spirits and health that she had when they were first married. So, accordingly, he pulled up a fir tree, and, after lopping off the roots and branches, made a walking stick of it, and set out on his way to, on, to Una. Una, or rather Finn, lived at this time at the very tip-top of Knockmany Hill, which faces a cousin of its own called Cullamore, that rises half-hill, half-mountain, up on the opposite side, east-east by south, as the sailors say when they wish to puzzle a glansman. Now, the truth is, for it must come out, that honest Finn's affection for his wife, though cordial enough in itself, was no matter or means for the real cause of his journey home. There was, at that time, another giant named Cucullin. Some say he was Irish, some say he was Scotch, but whether Scotch or Irish, sorrow doubt, but of it, he was a tiger. No other giant of the day could stand before him, and such was his strength that, when well vexed, he could stamp. He could give a stamp that shook the country around him. The fame and name of him went far and near, and nothing of the shape of a man, it was said, had any chance with him in a fight. Whether the story is true or not, I cannot say, but the report went that. By one blow of his fist, he flattened a thunderbolt and kept it in his pocket, in the shape of a pancake, to show all his enemies when they were about to fight him. Undoubtedly, he had given every giant in Ireland a considerable beating, barring Finn McCool himself, and he swore by solemn contents of Mal Kelly's primer that he would never give rest, night or day, winter or summer, till he would serve Finn with the same sauce if he could find him. Finn, however, who no doubt was a cock of the walk of his own dunghill, had a strong disinclination to meet the giant who could make a young earthquake or flatten a thunderbolt when he was angry, so accordingly he kept dodging about from place to place, not much to his credit as a Trojan. To be sure, whenever he happened to be hard word that Cohen was on the scent of him, this, then, was the morrow of the whole movement. Although he put it in his anxi anxiety to see Una, and I'm not saying, but there was some truth in that, too. However, the short and long of it was, with reverence be it spoken, that he heard Cucullin was coming to the causeway to have a trial of strength him, and he was naturally enough seized, and in consequence, with a very warm and sudden fit of affection for his wife, or a woman, who was delicate in her health and leading. Besides, a very lonely and comfortable life, and, he assured them, in his absence. He accordingly pulled up a fir tree, as I said before, and having snagged it through a walking stick, set out to affectionate travels to see his darling Una at the top of Nuckmini, by the way. <clears throat> In truth, to state the suspicions of the country at the time, the people wondered very much why it was that Finn selected such a windy spot for the dwelling house, and even went so far to tell him as much. What can you name, Mr. McCool, said they, by pitching your tent upon the top of Knockmany? 
where you never are without a breeze, night or day, winter or summer, and where you're often forced to take a nightcap without going to bed or turning up your little finger. Aye, where besides this, there is a sorrow want of water. Why, said Fenn, ever since I was the height of a round tower, I was known to be fond of having a good prospect of my own. And where are the Dickens' neighbors? Could I find a better spot for a good prospect than top of Knockmany? As for water, I'm sinking a pump, and, please goodness, as soon as the causeway's made, I intend to finish it. Now, this was more of Finn's philosophy, for the real state of the cause was that he pitched upon the top of Knockmany in order that he might be able to see Cacoan coming towards his house, and, of course, that he himself might go to look after the distant transactions in other parts of the country, rather than, well, what more matter. We do not wish to be too hard on Finn. All we have to say is that he wanted a spot from which to keep a sharp lookout, and, between ourselves, he did want it grievously, barring Sleeve Krub or Sleeve Donard, or its own cousin, Kalamor. He could not find a neater and more convenient situation for it in the sweet and sagacious province of Ulcer. God save all here, said Finn, good humouredly as he putting an honest face into his own door. Musha Fenovic, and you're welcome home to your own Una, you darling bully. Here followed a smack that is said to have made the waters of the lake and the bottom of a cur hail curl, as it were, with kindness and sympathy. Faith, said Finn, beautiful. And how are you, Una? And how did you sport your figure during my absence, my Billberry? Never a merrier, as bouncing a grass widow as ever there was in the sweet Tyrone among the bushes. Finn gave a short, good-humoured cough and laughed most heartily, to show her how much he was delighted that she made herself happy in his absence. And what brought you home so soon, Finn? she said. You, Avornin, said Finn, putting in his answer in the proper way. Never the thing but the purest of love and affection for yourself. Sure you know that's the truth anyhow, Una. Finn spent two or three happy days with Una and felt himself very comfortable, considering the dread that he had of Kekoan. This, however, grew upon him so much that his wife could not but perceive that something lay in his mind which kept him not to other than himself. Let a woman alone, in the meantime, for ferreting or wheedling a secret out of her good man, when she wishes, Finn was proof of this. It's this Cacullin, said Finn. That's troubling me. When the fellow gets angry, he begins to stamp. He'll shake you a whole townland, and it's well known that he can stop a thunderbolt, for he always carries one around him with him in the shape of a pancake, to show anyone that might misdoubt him. As he spoke, he clapped his thumb in his mouth, which always did what he wanted to with prophecy, or to know anything that happened in his absence. And the wife, who knew what it did, said, with weeping, Finn, darling, I hope you don't bite your thumb at me, dear. No, said Finn, I bite my thumb, Ashurza, he said. Yes, Jewel, but take care you don't draw blood, she said. And Finn, don't, my bully, don't. He's coming, said Finn. I see him blow Dungannon. Thank goodness, dear. And who is it, Vic? Glory be to God. That bastard Cacullin, replied Finn. And how to manage, I don't know. If I run away, I'm disgraced. And I know that sooner or later I must meet him, for my thumb tells me so. When will he be here? she said. Tomorrow, about two o'clock replied Finn, with a groan. Well, my bully, don't be cast down, said Una. Depend on me, and maybe I'll bring you out better for the scrape than you ever would bring yourself, by your rule of thumb. This quieted Finn's heart very much, for he knew that Una was hand and glove with the fairies, and, indeed, to tell the truth, she was supposed to be a fairy herself. <laughs> if she was, however, she must have been the kind-hearted one, for... By all accounts, she never did anything but good in the neighborhood. Now, it so happened that Una had a sister named Garana. 
living opposite them on the very top of Kakolmor. Which I have mentioned already, and this Garano was quite powerful herself. The beautiful valley that lies between them is not more than three or four miles abroad. So that a summoning's evening, Rana and Una were able to hold an agreeable conversation across it, from the top of one hilltop to the other. Upon this occasion, Una resolved to consult with her sister as what was best to be done in the difficulty that surrounded them. Ganoa, she said, are you at home? No, said the other. I'm picking bilberries in Althanthuan, or in English, in the Devil's Glen. Well, said Una, get up to the top of Colomore, look about you, and tell us what you see. Very well, cried Ganoa. After a few minutes, I'm there now. What do you see? asked the other. Goodness be about us, exclaimed Gwana. I see the biggest giant that ever was known coming up from Dungannon. Aye, said Una. That's our difficulty. That giant is the great Kokoan, and he's coming up now to Leather Finn. What's to be done? I'll call to him, she replied. Come up to Colomor and refresh himself. Maybe that you, maybe that will give you time to think of some plan and get yourselves out of the scrape. But she proceeded. I'm short of butter, having it in the house with only half a dozen firkins, and as I'm to have a few giants and giantesses to spend the evening with me, I'd feel thankful, Una, if you'd throw me up fifteen or sixteen tubs. Or a great mechan that you have. And you'll oblige me very much. I'll do that with a heart and a half, replied Una. And indeed, Granua, I feel myself under great obligations for you for your kindness in keeping him off of us. Till we see what can be done for what become of us if anything happened to poor Finn. She accordingly got the largest mescon of butter she had, which... Mm, might be about the weight of a couple dozen millstones, so that you may have easily judged its by its size. And calling up to her sister, Granua, she said, are you ready? I'm going to throw up the mask on, so be prepared to catch it. I will, said the other. A good throw, now, and take care it does not fall short. Una threw it, but in consequence of her anxiety about Finn and Kikoan, she forgot to say the charm that was to send it up, so that instead of reaching Colmore, as she expected, it fell about halfway between the two hills at the edge of the broad bog near Augur. My curse upon you, she exclaimed. You've disgraced me. Now I change you into grey stone. Lie there in testimony of what happened, and may evil would be tied the first living man that ever attempted to remove or injure you. And sure enough, there it lies this day, the mark of four fingers and a thumb imprinted on it, exactly as it came out of her hand. Never mind, said Granua. I must only do the best I can with Kikoan. If all fad, I'll give him a cast of heather broth to keep the wind out of his stomach, or a panda of bark, oak bark to draw it out of him. But above all things, think of some plan to get Finn out of the scrape he's in. Otherwise, he's a lost man. You know, he used to be as sharp and ready as what is any of my own opinion, Una, is that it will go hard with you, or you'll outdo Kikoan yet. Then she made a high smoke on top of the hill, and after which she put a finger in her mouth and gave three whistles. And by that, Kikoan knew that he was invited to Colmore for this was the way that the Irish long ago gave signs to all strangers and travelers to let them know that they were welcome to come and take share of whatever was going. In the meantime, Finn was very melancholy and did not know what to do or how to act. Kilcullen was an angry customer, no doubt, to mirror with, and, moreover, the idea of the confounded cake for him, said, flattened the very heart within him. What chance could he have, strong and brave though he was, with a man who could then put a passion 
rock the country into earthquakes and knock thunderbolts into pancakes. <sighs> the thing was impossible, and Finn knew not what hand could turn to. Right or left, backward or forward, where to go, he could phone no guess whatsoever. Una, said he, can you do nothing for me? Where's all your invention? Am I to be skivered like a rabbit before your eyes, and have to my name disgraced forever in the sight of my tribe? And me, the best man among them? How am I to fight this mountain man? This huge cross between an earthquake and thunderbolt, with a pancake in his pocket that was once... Be easy, Fen, replied Una. Troth, I'm ashamed of you. Keep your toe in your pump, will you? Talking pancakes. Maybe it'll give a good idea that when he brings with him, Thunderbolt or otherwise. If I don't treat him as smart feeding as he's got as many a day, never trust him again. Leave him to me, and do just as I bid you. This relieved Finn very much, for, after all, he had a great confidence in his wife, knowing, as he did, that she had got him out of many a quandary before. The present, however, was the greatest of all. But still he began to get courage, and was able to eat his victuals as usual. Una then drew the nine woolen threads of different colors, which she always did do to find out the best way of succeeding in anything of importance she went about doing. Then she plaited them into three plaits with three colors each, putting them on her right arm, around right arm, eh, around her heart and the third around her right ankle, for then she knew that nothing could fail her with what she undertook. Having everything now prepared, she went around the neighbors and borrowed one and twenty iron girdles, which she took and kneaded into the hearts of one and twenty cakes of bread. And these she baked on the fire the usual way, setting them aside with the cupboard and according to what they were done. She then put down a large pot of new milk, which she made into curds and whey, and gave Finn two instructions how to use the curds when Kikon should come. Having nothing, having done this, she sat down quite contented, waiting her arrival of the day at two o'clock, that being the hour at which she expected, for Finn knew as much by sucking of his thumb. Now this was a curious property of Finn's thumb. But, notwithstanding the, all the knowledge and logic that he used to suck out of it, it could never have stood to him were it not for the wit of his wife. In this very thing, moreover, he was very much resembling his great foe, Cohen, for it was well known that the huge strength he possessed all lay in the middle finger of his right hand, and that if he happened to, by a mischance, lose it, he was no more, notwithstanding his bulk, a common man. At length, the next day, he was seen coming across the valley, and Una knew that it was time to commence operations. She immediately made a cradle, and desired Finn to lie down it, and cover himself with the clothes. You must pass for your own child, said she. Just lie there snug, and say nothing but be guided by me. This, to be sure, was Wormwood to Finn. I mean, going into the cradle in such a cowardly manner. But he knew Una well, and finding that she, he had nothing else to do for it, his very rueful face gathered him into it and laid snug as she desired him. About two o'clock, as he had expected, Kikoan came in. God save all here, he said. Is this where the great Finn McCool lives? Indeed it is, honest man, replied Una. God save you kindly. Won't you be sitting? Thank you, ma'am, says he, sitting down. You are Miss McCool, I suppose? I am, said she, and I have no reason, I hope, to be ashamed of my husband. <laughs> no, said the other. He has the name of being the strongest and bravest man in Ireland, but for that, that, there's a man not far from you that's very desirous in taking a shake at him. Is he home? No, <laughs> she replied. If ever a man left his house in a fury, he did. 
It appears that someone told him a big bastion of a giant called Kakoan was being down his causeway to look for him. And so he set out there to try and see if he could catch him. Troth. I hope for the poor giant's sake he won't meet with him, for if he does, Finn will make paste of him at once. Well, said the other, I am Kakoan, and I have been seeking him these twelve months, but he always kept clear of me, and I will never rest night or day until I lay my hands on him. At this, Una set up a loud laugh, the great contempt, by the way, and looked at him as if only a mere handful of a man. Did you ever see Finn? said she, changing her manner all at once. How could I? said he. He always took care to keep his distance. <sighs> I thought so, she replied. I judge as much if you were to take my advice, you poor looking creature. You'll pray night and day that you never see him, for I tell you it will black be the black day for you when you do. But in the meantime, he perceived that the wind's on the door, and as Finn himself is home, home Maybe you'd be civil to turn the house, for it's always what Finn does when he's here. This was a startler, even for Cohen. He got up, however, and after pulling his middle finger in the right hand until it cracked three times, he went outside, and getting his arms around the house, completely turned it as if she had wished. When Finn saw this, he felt a certain d description of moisture, which shall be nameless, oozing through every pore of his skin. But Una, depending upon her woman's wit, felt not a whit daunted. Ah, right, then, she said. As you are so civil, maybe you'll do another obliging turn for us, as Finn's not here to do it himself. You see, after this long stretch of dry weather we've had, we feel very badly off for want of water. Now, Finn says there's a fine spring, well, somewhere under the rocks behind the hill here below. If it was his intention to pull them asunder, but having heard of you, he left the place in such a fury that never thought of it. Now, if you try it out, I'd trust feel my kindness. Then she brought the Cohen down to see the place, which was then at all one solid rock. After looking at it for some time, he cracked his right knuckle and he cracked his right middle finger nine times, stooped down and tore a cleft about four hundred feet deep and a quarter of a mile in length, which has since been christened by the name of Lumford's Glen. This feat nearly threw Una off her guard, but what won't a woman's sagacity and presence of mind accomplish? You will now come in, said she, and eat a bit of humble fare that what we can give you. Finn, even although he and you are enemies, would scorn not to treat you kindly in his own house, and indeed, if I didn't do it even in his absence, he would not be pleased with me. She accordingly brought him in, placing half a dozen of the cakes we spoke of before, together with a can or two of butter, a side of boiled bacon and a stack of cabbage, she desired him to help himself. For this, be it known, was long before the invention of potatoes. Kakoan, who, by the way, was a glutton as well as a hero, put one of the cakes in his mouth to take a huge whack out of it, and both Finn and Una were stunned with a noise that resembled something between a growl and a yell. Blood and the fury, he shouted. How is this? Here, two of my teeth out. What kind of bread is this you gave me? What's the matter? said Una coolly. Matter? shouted out the other again. Why, there are two of my best teeth and my head are gone. Why, said she, that's Finn's bread, the only bread he ever eats at home. But, indeed, I forgot to tell you that nobody can eat it but himself and the child with the cradle there. I thought, however, as you were reported to be a rather stout little fellow by your size, he might be able to manage it. But I do not wish to affront a man that thinks himself able to fight Finn. Here's another cake. Maybe it's not so hard as that. Kikoan, at the moment, was not only very hungry, but ravenous, so accordingly he made fresh set of the second cake, and immediately another yell was heard twice as loud as the first. Thunder and giblets! he roared. 
Take your bread out of this, or I will not have tooth left in my head. There's another pair of them gone. Well, honest man, replied Una, if you're not able to eat the bread, say so quietly. I don't want you waking the child in the cradle there. <sighs> there, now he's awake upon me. So now gave a squirrel that started a giant coming from the, such a youngster as he was repentant to be. Mother, said he, I'm hungry. Get me something to eat. Anna went over and putting it into his hand a cake that had no griddle in it. Finn, whose appetite in the meantime was sharpened by what he saw going forward, soon made it disappear. Gakolin was thunderstruck and secretly thanked his stars that he had the good fortune to miss meeting Finn. For, as he said to himself, I'd have no chance to, with a man who could eat such bread as this, and even a son who's but in the cradle can munch before my eyes. I'd like to take a glimpse of the lad the cradle, he said to Una, for I can tell you that the infant who can manage that nutrient is no joke to look at, or feed a scarce summer. With all the veins of my heart, replied Una, get up, Akushla, and show this decent little man something that... Won't be unworthy of your father, Finn McCool. Finn, who was dressed for the occasion as much a little boy as possible, got up, bringing Kekolin out. Are you strong? said he. Thunder and hounds, exclaimed the other. What a voice in such a small chap. Are you strong? said Finn again. Are you able to squeeze water out of that white stone? he asked, putting in one in Kekolin's hand. The latter squeezed and squeezed the stone, but put no purpose. He might pull the rocks of Lumford Glen asunder and flatten a thunderbolt, but to squeeze water out of a white stone was beyond his strength. Finn eyed him with great contempt, as he kept straining and squeezing and squeezing and straining, till he got black in the face with the, effort, with the efforts. Ah, you're a poor creature, said Finn. You, a giant... Give me the stone here, and I'll show you what little Finn's little son can do. You may judge, of course, what my daddy himself. Finn took the stone, and slightly exchanging it for the curds, squeezed the ladder until the way was clear as water. It was a little slower from his hand. Now I'll go in, he said, to my cradle, for I'd lose the scorn of time with Anyone who's not able to eat my daddy's bread or squeeze water from a stone. But, Dad, you had better be off this before he comes back. For if he catches you, it's a flummery you'll have in two minutes. Gekoen, seeing what he had seen, was the same opinion himself. <laughs> His knees knocked together with the terror of Finn's return and accordingly hastened and bid Una's farewell and to assure her that from that day out he never wished to hear of, much less see, her husband. I admit fairly that I'm not a match for him, said he. Strong as I am, tell him I will avoid him as I would the plague, and that I will make myself scarce in this part of the country for while I live. <laughs> Finn, in the meantime, had gone into the cradle, where he lay very quietly, his heart at mouth delight the Cohen who was about to take his departure, without discovering the tricks that had been played upon him. <clears throat> it's so well for you, said Una, that he doesn't happen to be here, for it's nothing but hawk's meat if you make of you. I know that, says Cacolin. Devil a thing else he'd make me make of me, but before I go, will you let me feel what kind of teeth they are in that griddle bread like that? He pointed at he pointed as he spoke. With all pleasure in life, said she. Only as they're far back in his head, you must put your finger in a good way. The Cohen was surprised to find such a powerful set of grinders in one so young. But he was still much more on the finding, and he took his hand from Finn's mouth that he left the very finger upon which he, the whole strength depended behind him. He gave one loud groan and fell down once with terror and weakness. This was all Finn wanted. Ooh, 
now knew that his most powerful and bitterest enemy was completely at his mercy. He instantly started out of the cradle, and with a few minutes of the great Kikon, so that so much should think the time of terror of him, that his, fellow, that his followers lay a corpse before him. Thus did Finn, through the wit and invention of Una, his wife, succeed in overcoming his enemy by stratagem, which he would have never done by force. Thus also it proved that women, if they bring us into any unpleasant scrape, can sometimes succeed in getting us out of others that are as bad. <laughs>